the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We're continuing our series on union with Christ. We said that this is the highest goal, the highest aim, the purpose of our being. There is no greater object of your life. It cannot be replaced with anything. There are other lofty goals, but none should supersede this one. So, the question is, now that we're trying to be like Christ and united with Christ, how do we get there? We said that the very first and necessary step is repentance. There is no way that we could begin to imitate the holy and perfect one without wanting to get rid of that which is unholy and imperfect. The things that are opposite to him. You can't unite light with darkness or sin with perfection or even the Clippers with the Lakers. Some things just cannot be done. We have to uproot the sin before we acquire the virtue. We said this is part of the purification process. It's part of the process where one becomes purified, sanctified, and illumined. Now we have to realize that repentance is not a one-time thing. It is an ongoing process. We don't give up on repentance until sin is gone. When there's nothing else to change, then you can stop. And we pray that not only does repentance continue, but that it grows. To what point? What point do we want our repentance to grow? Our repentance is not just to acknowledge sin or to regret sin. Hopefully our repentance gets to the point where we hate sin. Where we despise sin, that we war against sin, that we consider sin to be no more a part of us. We don't want our repentance to be an external act. We want it to be so sincere and so effective that it changes us. And I want you to realize repentance is like what we need when we say we need clean water and we need clean air. That's how important repentance is to us in our lives and it is a constant daily struggle. Where do we begin in our union with Christ? It begins with repentance. We said the next step was humility. Humility is the foundation of the spiritual life. It is the beginning. And it's kind of acknowledging what is humility. It's acknowledging who we really are and who God really is. When you have a real, honest evaluation of yourself, you begin to draw near to God. You begin to realize how much we are dependent on Him, how much we need Him, how much His grace is so important to us. And we know that if we draw, if we are humble, God draws near to us. But if we are proud, it says He knows us from afar. Those who humble themselves, God will lift them up. There is no way to get close to Christ without humility. Every virtue that you gain in this process of becoming like Christ, every single virtue you gain could easily be lost without humility. St. Macarius says this story, which it always strikes me. He says there were two monks who saw visions of heaven for six years, and yet I tell you, even weeping, even they have fallen. Seeing vision for six years, you think they're done. You think they've arrived. And yet this sin of pride could be used to attack us no matter what level you reach. It even brought down the angels. Now, in holding on to pride, there's no way we're imitating Christ. In holding on to pride, we're imitating the exact opposite. We're imitating Satan, who said that he was great even as God was. If we acquire humility, we will rely on God, we will have that necessary trust, the honor and the consideration for God's will and His desires before our own. Humility is like a spiritual magnet for God's grace. Humility is a spiritual magnet for God's grace. It gives God a place to be God in our lives rather than ourselves. 
So, we're kind of beginning this process like children, hoping to grow into the spiritually mature person, to grow into the image of Christ. We're all like children. And that's how I want us to see ourselves, at least for this talk. Every one of you is a parent. But I want you to realize that the role that you play with your children, in today's talk, the parenting role is how I want you to see God. The child role, that's how I want you to see you today. There's a verse in Ephesians 5.1. Be imitators of God as dear children. Be imitators of God as dear children. Now I'm going to play with this for a little bit, so just humor me. But when you think of dear children, what do you think of? The good, polite child that says, yes, mommy, whatever you say, I would be happy to, that you always know what is best. Those are the dear children. Now take for a moment the not-so-dear children. And what do we think about the not-so-dear children? These are the ones that add the yin to your yang. Uh, they're, you know the ones I'm talking about. The ones that say no, 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 no. They're the ones that race faster and faster towards a power outlet with a knife that fits perfectly as you tell them not to. They're the ones that in coloring with permanent marker on the walls, they insist rather than using paper, no matter how much you try. The more you run away, the more you run to them, they run away. They rise when you say sleep, and when you say quiet, they scream. Yes, I'm talking about your nieces and nephews. Because of course, this wouldn't be our children, right? None of us have kids like that, right? Those kids, they have a special name. They're called strong-willed children. They're the ones that lead you to ask God to give you the authority over lightning just once. <laughs> they just won't obey what you say. And I know that it sounds funny, but it happens all the time. And what I want you to remember for this talk is that you play the role of the kid. So which kid are you? What is the difference between the dear kid and the not so dear kid? It's obedience. One obeys and the other insists on not obeying. Everyone wants our kids to be obedient. Nothing would make us more proud, right? Like if my kid cannot color in the lines, if they cannot carry a tune for two notes, but they did everything that we said, we would say, I have the perfect child. Nothing honors you more the kid that you invested in, the kid that you plan for, you have dreams for, the kid that you love to death, nothing honors you more when they just say, okay, I'll do what you ask. No arguing, no hesitation, just trust and obedience. And nothing drives you more psychotic. Nothing makes you pull out more hair Nothing makes you invest in birth control devices and make you want to sleep in a separate room from your spouse than the kid that never does what you tell them to do. So what is obedience? What is obedience? There's a, a definition. It says compliance with an order, a request, or a law. But what I have on your sheet is this. Obedience is submission to another's authority. It is submission to another's authority. And in our case, that's God. Obedience is a voluntary act of the will. It's a choosing to submit to the will of someone else. You know that you can't force obedience? You can't force it. You can threaten people, but ultimately they have to volunteer to do it. They might choose the consequences. You can always choose to obey or disobey. So why do we choose to disobey when we disobey? 
Like, what are the reasons for disobeying things? Well, one thing is we don't agree with what was requested. For whatever reason, we may not understand why it is told to us. Many of us feel like we shouldn't pay taxes. I mean, we went to work, and we earned the money, so we feel like we should keep it. And so many of us try to avoid paying taxes. It's the law, and we just don't agree with it. So we choose not to obey it. Sometimes we just don't see or think we're going to receive the consequence, or don't care if there is one. I mean, if you thought you would get a ticket every time you exceeded the speed limit by one mile an hour, how often would you do it? You would obey every single time. But because you don't expect to get a consequence, you choose to disobey on a very rare occasion. Just the times when you're in the car, right? Every time we disobey because we just don't think there's a consequence. Oftentimes we won't obey when you don't respect the one who makes the request. Like when you call a customer service representative, and you've been on a hold for so long, and you know that they don't know what they're doing, and they tell you to just call this number, and you've done that 18 times, and you'd say, I don't want to do anything that you say, I want to speak to someone else. When you don't request the person giving you the instructions, or maybe you don't trust the person giving you the order, as if they don't have your best interests in mind. And I agree, you shouldn't obey everyone, especially if their intentions are ill. Sometimes we obey just because it's hard, or it's inconvenient, or it's uncomfortable. But a lot of us just disobey because we're just too proud. We've got a lot of pride. I'm sure you have had kids that at one time it says, no one can tell me what to do. I don't want to take orders from anyone else. I want to be my own boss. I want to make my own decisions. And I want to live my life the way I want. There could be other reasons, but when you think about it, we put ourselves in the role of a child and God in the role of the requester in those situations not agreeing with what the requester asks, not trusting their interests, um, not respecting them because they asked us something that's inconvenient or that we have so much pride is the reason that we choose not to obey God. How does that make you feel? That I just don't trust God enough to obey to the fullest extent. When it comes down to it, I hate disobedience of others. When other people disobey, it drives me crazy. Not so much when I disobey. But understand how much you hate disobedience. So let's look at a couple of examples of obedience in the Bible. The absolute two best examples. You could disagree with me, but I think you'd be wrong. From the beginning of the story of Abraham, he was obedient. He is like the model of obedience in the Bible. He left his homeland for an unknown land. God said, I want you to go someplace I'm going to show you. Where is it? I'm not going to tell you. Well, what's there? Don't worry about it. Uh, who's going to be there? Are they going to receive me? Don't worry. I'm sending you. So what did Abraham do? He went. That's pretty tough to get up to go from here to there without knowing anything. Then God gave him another order. I want you to circumcise all the males of whatever age. Um, this is one that I would think is awkward, uncomfortable, definitely worth negotiating, I would think. But he didn't. 
And so God took him from one level of obedience to another level of obedience until he took him to the highest level. I mean, the situation of Isaac. As a parent, I'm sure this hits home as one of the greatest acts of obedience that I will ever hear. Can you imagine waiting on God for about 25 years? 25 years to have a son in your old age, and you know the son came by a miracle because your wife was too old to be having children. You get the long-awaited answer, the promise to your prayers. This is your greatest source of joy. This is your future. This is your legacy for generations. Yourself continuing to live through this person. And because God sees how much you love that son, he asks you not to abandon the son, not to let someone else take the son's life, but you, by your own hands, take the son of the promise. It sounds like the most ridiculous, mean, cruel, unthoughtful request. And what did Abraham do? He didn't negotiate, he didn't argue. It says he woke up early and he set his face to the mountain and he took Isaac. It's amazing. What were the characteristics of the obedience of Abraham that we could learn from? It was out of humility. Number one, it was out of humility. He understood now here's Abraham, he's the head of the household. In those times, he was the patriarch, he was the man, and he was a wealthy man. Here's a man with authority. I'm the man of the house. I'm also supposed to make the major decisions. They just happen to agree with everything that my wife said five minutes before, but I make the decisions. And then, Abraham, he said, I know who I am, but I know even more who God is. And there's no comparison. God deserves my complete allegiance. He's God. There's no questioning. He is a zillion times more knowledgeable, more wise, more powerful than I am. He just knows things. And because I respect and honor him, I will do it. It's out of humility. Obedience is out of humility, which is why we talked about that last week. And obedience actually leads to humility. The two go hand in hand. Number two, he didn't have to like the request in order for him to obey it. You understand that? He didn't obey just because it sounded nice. I mean, these three things all sounded horrible. He didn't say, well, I'm going to obey when the next request comes. If there's a good one that says, you know, oh, I want you to increase your lands and make more money. and I want you to, like, live in a bigger house. I will obey that one. It wasn't because he liked the request that he obeyed. It was because of who requested. Number three, he had faith that God, in all his wisdom and power, was going to do the best thing. It says in, in Hebrews that even putting Isaac there, he knew that God could raise him from the dead. And even though God asks you something that in your vision doesn't make sense at all, and it seems completely opposite of what seems right, if it's what God has asked you to do, do you believe that he could make the situation right? Could he make it best for you? Like St. Peter getting out of the boat and walking on water. Sounds ridiculous. But if he falls, I'm sure he believed that Christ could save him. I mean, he saw him calm the storm before. It doesn't have to make sense to you. You just have to trust that if God gives the command, he takes the responsibility. Number four, his obedience was immediate. I want you to understand that delayed obedience, delayed obedience is current disobedience. 
Does that make sense? Delayed obedience is current disobedience. He did it right away. And number three, he did it out of love. Or sorry, number five. He did it out of love. Abraham, why would you do such a crazy thing? Because I love God. I mean, if you look at what Christ said, obedience is directly related to love. In John 14, Christ says this in verses 15, 21, and 23. So within these eight verses, he says this. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's verse 15. Verse 21. He who has my commands and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. In verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. You notice the pattern? It's not a very difficult pattern. If you love God, or want to, or want to be like Him, or united to Him, where He and the Son make their home in you, there is no way around it. There is no better way to show your love to a God than to obey. There's no better way to show your love than to obey. And now I'm going to talk to you about the other amazing example. Jesus Christ himself. We read this in the Igbeya every day. And now I have told you before it comes to pass that when it does come to pass you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming. And he has nothing in me but that the world may know. The world may know that as I love the Father. As the Father gave me commandment. So I do. I love the Father, and I want the world to know. And as the commandment He gave me, what did He say? So I do. Amazing words. Christ was the ultimate example of obedience. I mean, He came down from heaven. You know, Abraham had to go from one land to another land. It was going to be full of promise. Christ came down from heaven. He says, or I came down from heaven. Why? It's going to be miserable. What were you promised? He says, I came down not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And then if you got anything out of this talk, the next thing that Christ said, I want you to say often, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the time of his most severe anguish and passion, he said this, not my will, but thy will be done. If you said that daily and often, you would become very united to Christ quickly. Not my will, but thy will be done. I'm going to read this passage, one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible, Philippians 2, chapter 5, to verse 8. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Have the same way of thinking, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself first. And he became obedient. To what point? To the point of death. Even the death on the cross. Obedient to death. Even the death on the cross. One of the most amazing verses in all the Bible. He is the ultimate example of obedience. There was nothing he would not do for the Father. His obedience was truly an act of love. It was to honor the Father. It was out of complete humility. Submission to and choosing the will of the Father over his own. He believed in the Father's purpose. He didn't consider his own comfort. He did not negotiate. He did not partially obey. He fulfilled the Father's will completely. Just like everyone 
who has been truly united to God. Not people who just do good things. Not people who are just good Christians who read their Bibles and say some prayers. But people who have been truly united to God, they completely subdue their will. And they accept God's will completely. Someone once said, how can we call ourselves Christians when we never do anything because God asks us to do them? Or never not do something because God asks us not to do them? When was the last time you said, God told me to do this, so I'm doing it? I mean, in the background, we try to be good. But when was the last time you said, God told me, therefore I do? Or God told me not to, therefore I won't. When was the last time those words came into your mind? This whole idea of obedience, how far should we carry it? I'm going to read a, tell you a story. And this story, when I read it, it, it like just blew my mind. So it was a story about persecution in communist Russia. There was a pastor who knew that he was going to be separated from his family. He said, they're going to come take me to prison. And what I would be happy to hear, that you died believing in Christ, than rather to deny. He said, be strong. So they came the very next day. They took him to prison and they sent his family to the lovely Siberia. They went to Siberia, which is like, in the middle of nowhere. Apparently there are people that live there and there's a congregation there. The pastor's wife and her family were sent to Siberia. So they were eating their last piece of bread one night and the kids said, Mom, you know, what are we going to eat tomorrow? She says, I don't know. God will provide. God will provide. Let's just pray. Don't worry. So she prayed. At that time that she prayed, an individual, a deacon of the church, was woken up and he got the message that he should go and take the food of the church to the pastor's wife. Now this was around midnight and he argued with the voice saying, you realize that it's freezing outside, that I will probably freeze to death, my horse will probably freeze to death and if we go outside, there's wolves outside, they're probably going to kill us Anyway, we're probably not going to make it back. And the voice said, I didn't ask you to come back. I asked you to go. So he went. He went obedient, almost to the point of death, in the cold. And he rode on his horse throughout the night and he arrived early in the morning the next day with a bag of food for the pastor and his wife, sorry, for the pastor's wife. And she was in awe. She said, why did you come? Because God told me to. When was the last time I really obeyed? Because God told me to. So I'm just going to conclude with these last few concrete things. Um, for us to kind of work on obedience. Number one, we have to get rid of the spirit of disobedience. You know, when we get asked to fast, or we get asked to go to church, or we get asked to pray, or to read the Bible, or some of us, the very first reaction we have when we're asked to do something by God is no. God wants me to forgive that person. And we say no. God wants me to not love money so much. So he wants me to give more so that I would rely on him. And I say no. There's a certain sin that he wants me to stop. And I say no. We ultimately make excuses all the time. We make so many excuses, like it's too hard. It's uncomfortable. We could go on forever and ever with excuses on why we won't obey. 
We need to crush that spirit of disobedience. You read something in the Bible and you highlight it and say, oh, this is a great verse for a Sunday school lesson. Or this moves me. I love to read this verse. When do you say, thy will be done, not my will? Number two is humility. Without humility, we'll never be obedient. So we have to ultimately work on trusting in God. Humility is not, the Father said, do not trust yourself this side of the grave. Do not trust yourself this side of the grave. So then you should trust who? God. And then do you have faith in God's intentions and His commandments? You know, the commandments are very similar to why we tell our kids to do things and not do things. Why do we tell them to do them? It's not to make me happy all the time. Sometimes I abuse it, I confess. But a lot of time I tell them not to do something because it hurts them. I have their ultimate good in mind. And God says, I know the thoughts that I have for you. I the thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Those are his thoughts towards us. He doesn't have any evil intentions. And asking us to give things up, he doesn't enjoy seeing us suffer. He enjoys seeing us grow and become what he intended us to be, even if it's painful. Even if it's painful. Do we trust God? You trust so many other people. You obey them. The stewardess that says, put your seatbelts on in the airplane. You do it. Some traffic control says, make a right here. You're like, okay, it looks like a long line and there's traffic for hours. Okay, I'll do it. We trust them. The doctor says, take this medicine. You trust them. I'll confess, doctors don't know everything. That's a personal witness. And yet we obey people that don't have the ability that God does. Why do we not trust God? Then the next thing I want to say is start off obeying God in small things and be consistent. The Bible says when you are faithful in little things, God will make you ruler over many. I'm not asking you all to carry Christ's cross and be crucified today. But what I am asking to do is this. The more you are obedient in small stuff, the more God gives you grace to do great and bigger things. Obedience comes by the aid and grace of God. You can't just do it on your own. You can't fight Him and expect to be obedient. You have to crush your own will. I want you to realize partial obedience is considered disobedience. Does that make sense? Partial obedience, like I'm going to obey 70%. It means I'm disobedient, 30%. So what he wants is complete obedience. Number seven, what I would love is for us to offer small acts of obedience, not out of fear. Although we should, we always start with fear. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But what I would love for you to do is begin to be obedient out of love. St. Teresa of the Little Flower, she's a Catholic saint. I mean, she said, I have a small soul, and so I can only offer small things. And she would offer small acts of obedience with great love. Mother Teresa said a very similar thing. You don't need to do great acts, but do small things with great love. And so what I've asked for you to do as homework is to read Psalm 119 and Psalm 19. Psalm 119 inspires me. David, who wrote it, is in love with the commands of God. To him, it is a delight. It is his desire. It's as if... He would rather do nothing else. It brings him joy to obey God. 
I pray that God would give us the same spirit of obedience that's out of joy and out of love. Think about your spouse. Think about your parents. When you say, I will do what you ask, not because I enjoy it, not because I'm afraid of you, even though I don't want to, I do it because I love you. God, I want to get to the level of obeying you because I love you so much that whatever I could do to please you would be my greatest joy. Now, when I was reading on all the Orthodox websites talking about obedience, this is like the critical thing is that we are obedient to a spiritual guide. If we want to grow in union with Christ, we need to have a wise, learned, spiritual person that has experience, and they will tell us what to do. And we are instructed to obey with absolute surrender. I don't know how much we're really trying to be close to our spiritual guides, how much we honor them and how much we expect them to lead us probably because of our lack of humility, our lack of trust, and our desire not to do something that someone else tells us. But it is critical for us to be united with God to follow the acts or the wisdom of a spiritual guide. So now you have to go. And then my prayer is that we would perform the ultimate acts of obedience. There is this title of a book, and it kills me called Absolute Surrender. Absolute Surrender. Sometimes I hear a song and the words are, and I surrender all to you. It brings me to tears because I haven't. And it's so hard for me. But that's my dream. That's my prayer for me and for you. Absolute Surrender. For God's glory now and forever. Amen.